Now that was fine for me, but let's give Jesus a hand praise. If you have two hands that he's blessed you with, you owe him a praise, amen? If he woke you up this morning, you owe him a praise. If you are allowed to breathe the breath of life through your nostrils and allow the oxygen to flow through your veins, you owe him a praise. Let's give him a praise offering. So if you don't know it yet, yes, I am a Pentecostal preacher. And uh, you know, we uh, the holy rollers as they call us uh, and a lot of other things. <laughs> Um, and uh, in our church, it is, a, it is a little bit about call and response. And in case, you know, nobody wanted to get an amen every now and then, I did bring a few people with me, so I know they got my back. Amen? Amen. If not, I'm going to ask PJ to go down to the store and buy me a six-pack can of amen and bring it back here. So, let me set this timer because... Pentecostal preachers can go pretty long. And uh, let's see here, where we go? All right. Um, first of all, I just want to give honor to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and God who is yet the head of my life. Uh, and then I want to give honor to my good friend. Uh, let's all give him a pr God a praise offering for Dr. Jackson. A man that has uh, really built this school up, who has a vision um, to win the world for Christ. Amen. He is a leader in a myriad of areas. And I thank God for my niece being here and nephew and them doing the worship uh, on today. And of course, my beautiful wife and my best friend, uh, the queen of my life, uh, my Nubian princess, uh, Cheryl Marie Baines and then all of my kids that are here. So, all right. Jessup, are you with me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so today we're going to go to a very familiar passage. Um, now, typically I don't ever wear a hat when I'm speaking, but I wanted to look a little young today. And then my hat has a message on it, right? Jesus fought for the poor. Um, and I thought that was important and appropriate. And it's from the He Gets Us things that you see those commercials on TV and what have you. Um, so we want to go to the book of St. Luke, the 25th chapter, the 10th chapter and the 25th verse in the 37 through the 37. Dr. Jackson, can you throw me my phone? Because I actually have my Bible on there. Not, not, <laughs> you didn't actually throw it, right? No, I didn't. And um, we know that Luke was a physician. He was very detailed uh, in his writings. And so we're going to a very familiar um, story in here uh, where he is talking about, uh, there's a lawyer and they're talking about uh, a parable that Jesus communicates. All right, Luke 10 and 25. And the word of the Lord reads, On one occasion, an expert of the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? Jesus replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied, do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him uh, for being half dead, a priest happened to 
be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Now, which of these three do you think was the neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robber? Well, the expert in the law, the lawyer basically, said the one who had mercy on him, Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. So, for subject today, <clears throat> and my voice, uh, please pray for me because my voice is a little hoarse, uh, and pray that it doesn't go out. Amen? Amen. For subject today, uh, we're going to use, Lord, help me see the opportunity to love. Look at your neighbor and say, Lord, help me to see the opportunity to love. And for a subject a subtopic, we're going to say, who is my neighbor? Now look at your other neighbor and say, ask them that question. Who is my neighbor? So we're grateful, you know, to be here today. And happy Black History Month. That's what I thought. I thought I would wear this African attire that I actually got from a trip to li a mission trip to Liberia in uh, December. And, um, and we also want to acknowledge that um, on the 27th of this month was the day where a black congresswoman, Shirley Chisholm, uh, was an educator and an author that served uh, New York's 12th district um, and a myriad of others that helped shape our country. Now, there was a pastor and during his sermon, um, he was quoting Jesus, love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, and to emphasize that point, he kept on saying it, but with more intensity, love your neighbor. Who is my neighbor? He said, who is my neighbor? He said, who is my neighbor? And there was a little boy in the audience that whispered quietly, Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, Mr. Rogers. So we all know, you know, about Fred Rogers and, and the great uh, children's television, uh, the fame of, you know, being a good neighbor. And, but in this story, we're looking at that question from the lawyer uh, to Jesus, and he was trying to justify uh, his position in life and what he felt was important to him, but maybe not really what the spirit of what Jesus was saying or the law was saying. And so, uh, Jessup, I want to ask you the question, who is your neighbor? Who is your neighbor? Now, the parable arises out of this discussion uh, between Jesus and this Pharisee. Um, and we know that he was a Pharisee um, because we know that uh, the Pharisees were ones that one believed, Sadducees and the Pharisees, the Sadducees didn't believe in eternal life, but the Pharisees did. And so we're able to see that. And so he's this he was a good lawyer. He knew the law inside and out, but he was trying to actually ask a trick question to trip Jesus up because they didn't like Jesus because of uh, he was disrupting their ecosystem. You know, he was uh, giving them problems and taking their, uh, the, the minds that they had uh, communicated to the masses and trying to change them to what God wanted them to do. They didn't like that. They wanted to be the main focus. 
How many of you here at Jessup University uh, sometimes may get a little wayward in what you're doing or what you're saying, and you get a little off track? But then, all of a sudden, someone comes to you and says, hey, uh, I got a word from the Lord. Uh, you know, and, and a good friend will tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. Right. Amen, Walls. Amen. And so here's this teacher, and, 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 the, and he says, this lawyer, I, I, want, I want to inherit eternal life, um, and I want to be able to be blessed, but in essence, he's really just trying to trick him. And so he asked the question, um, and, 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 and Jesus said, well, what does the law say? And he says, to love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, and with all your soul. Now that's something that is a commandment to all of us. My favorite scripture is, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, that you have love, what? One to another. Amen. It did not say because you looked a certain way or you had a social economic status or you have this uh, academia background. It did not say that it says you are to love your neighbor as yourself. The greatest commandment is to love thy God. And the second is to love your neighbor as yourself. The challenge is that some of us don't want to love our neighbor because we don't love ourselves. Mm. So, what did this lawyer do? He quotes from Deuteronomy 6, uh, uh, he was, which was part of the Shema, which is a confession regularly made by in Jewish worship. And so, you are correct, Jesus says. Guess what? You get an A+. Plus. How many in here would like to get an A+. Plus? Yeah. All right, my timer's telling me my 10 minutes was gone, so I got to keep on moving and keep on moving here. And so he, he did that. And, and so Jesus didn't have any complaint in all, any of this. And, 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 and so you shall live as you are loving God and you are loving your neighbor. And, you know, in essence, the law, but you have worded it succinctly, Jesus said. So you're doing a good job. Now, the question had been asked and the answer has been given, and you would think that this man would be pleased and just go home. But curious minds sometimes just got to keep, keep asking questions. And you have to know something about lawyers. My best friend's a lawyer, and lawyers typically are not always seldom happy. Amen? Uh, uh, he, he, this particular lawyer, he, he, this responsibility was to define the limits, and these are lawyers, of liability. That's how lawyers are. But he is trying to justify himself, so he asks, who is my neighbor? In other words, where does my responsibility stop and who exactly am I responsible for? We like to put parameters around things that we really don't want to go there. Sometimes we don't want to go deep with somebody because we just don't want to hear their problems. It's about ourselves. It's not about what our neighbors are going through. So at this point, instead of further defining the question, Jesus tells a story, uh, and, uh, and that's a, a way of indirect teaching, amen? And so he talks about a certain rich man that was going from Jerusalem to Jericho, and we can surmise that this man was probably a Jew, and, and he's going down uh, this road um, and right into the heart of Jerusalem. Judea, it's like a serpentine road. It's about 17 miles. And if you know anything about Jericho and Jerusalem, uh, Jerusalem sits very high. It's about 2,500 square feet above sea level. Jericho is about 800 feet below sea level. And it's actually the, uh, the, the lowest city on earth. And so here they are, um, uh, they're on the Jericho Road, which was notoriously known to be very thief infested. Now, I come, and our church is in the city of East Palo Alto, and if you read the news lately, you would have heard um, about the city that uh, in 2023 we are proud of, which is we didn't have a single homicide in the city of East Palo Alto. Now, that in itself 
is nothing but a God thing, huh? Uh, because when I look at it, if you knew anything about the city of East Palo Alto, you would have seen that in 93, 94, which was before many of you were probably born, um, that it was the murder capital of the United States per capita. So this is very significant. It's been on CNN and Fox News. And why is it, why, what was the real reason why our city turned around? It's because we got outside of our four walls being the faith community. Hello, somebody. And we went into the highway and hedges and compelled them to come in. In other words, we became a good neighbor to our community. We sought after what their needs were. We, we heard their stories. We, we talked to them and not at them. Hello, somebody. Are you a good neighbor? That's my question. It's not really about who is your neighbor. It's about are you a good neighbor? Now, I'm not saying from my perspective, I'm saying from his holy word. I'm saying what has God said into you and he's provided an opportunity. Our subject today is, you know, what? Lord, help me to see an opportunity to love. Many times we miss the opportunities because we are not in alignment with God. We are not in alignment with the Holy Spirit because we are so self-centered. I'm sorry, I'm a Pentecostal preacher. I'm going to come at you. I'm going to keep it 100, young folks. Huh? Are you a good neighbor? I'm not trying to put a guilt trip on you, but I'm trying to allow you and illuminate God's word in such a way where you can see yourself in it. I want to inspire you, and yes, I want to impart something on, into you. Yes, I want to inform you, but we need to be about our Father's business. Amen? He said, I must work while it's day, because when nighttime cometh, no man can work. And one thing I love about you young people, you may not have a lot of money, you may not have a lot of resources, but you have a lot of creativity and you have a lot of energy. And God has beautifully and wonderfully made each and every one of you. It's a privilege to be here. And it's a privilege to serve God. Huh? We are all covered by his blood. But are we being a good neighbor? It's not who my neighbor is because what we tend to do, and this is adult, older, older young people like me. I'm an older young person. We tend to want to put people in a box. Hmm? And then when we put them in that box, that means we put these parameters on how we are going to uh, deal with them, how we're going to interact with them, if we're going to talk to them. Well, they don't look like me. Uh-oh. They have an accent. Uh-oh. They're not the same social economic status as my pedigree. Hmm? They come from a different part of the city are a different state in the union. You see, it does not make a difference. If you are a foreign student from a different country, God loves you no less and he loves you no more. If you were born right here, God loves you no less or no more. You are somebody's neighbor and somebody is your neighbor. But what love are we demonstrating? What love are we reflecting? Are we demonstrating a Christ-like character? If you look at the story, it was the pastor, uh-oh, that came by the person that was beat up first. And the pastor was like, uh-uh, oh no, I, I, don't know who this, I don't know who this guy is. I, I can't help him. Well, I work in the homeless industry, huh? Because <laughs> it's like an industry to me, huh? We, we have a shelter in San Francisco, a 100-bed shelter, and we were soon a 100-bed shelter in East Palo Alto. And so many people will not give 
our unhoused brothers and sisters eye-to-eye -eye contact. What they will do is they'll do this. They'll be like the priests. Oh. Hmm? They'll walk right by them. They won't even see them. They won't even acknowledge them. They won't pay the, them the dignity and respect that that unhoused brother and sister deserves by just having eye-to-eye -eye contact. Now, I'm not saying for you to go out and engage every unhoused person you see because uh, some unhoused per people are dual diagnosed. What does that mean? That means they may be on drugs or they may have mental health challenges. But I am saying anybody can look at someone and give them that respect. So that was the priest. He, he really didn't want to do that, right? And then here we got the social worker, the Levite. He was in, responsible for taking care of the tabernacle, taking care of the temple. And what does he do? He passes on the other side, and he like, oh, this is not a safe place. This is not a place that I should be in. Did he see about the wounded person? He says, oh, no, he's, he's looking like he's half dead, uh, if not completely dead. He didn't want to participate in helping that fellow Jew, which is what we all assume and, and the great theologians assume, that was right there lying down. But yet, he calls himself a Christian. Yet the priest calls himself a Christian. And then who comes by? A Samaritan. Well, why is that significant? Uh, somebody asked me why. Why, I'm glad you asked. Um... Because Samaritan historically and the Jews were enemies. Uh, Jews looked down upon the Samaritans. They looked at them as dogs. Huh? So they didn't respect them whatsoever. They looked at them as half-breeds. But yet the Samaritan got out of his Lamborghini and got down and said, Oh my goodness. Let me see. The Bible says he had compassion on that person. How many of us have compassion? Now, how many of us are willing to share that compassion? Huh? How many of us are willing to act on that compassion? You see, it's a difference. The word of God says, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. That's James 1 and 22. A lot of times we want to hear the word of God, but we don't want to act upon it. Hello. Like when your teachers tell you to study for this, study for that. Uh-oh, I'm going to get some stones here thrown at me. Huh? And then you want to cram at the last minute. You know, you want to put two hours or, or, or four hours worth of study time in five minutes. And then you wonder what happens with the grades. Okay, I'm sorry. That was for free. Uh, and so here he is. He takes up the man. He bandages up the man and he cleans up his wounds, puts him in his Lamborghini, takes him to the Four Seasons Hotel pays for it, and then says, if there's any additional expenses, let me know, and I'll come back and pay whatever additional cost it is. That's love. What has love got to do with it? Everything. Our Christian faith is built on love, and love is colorblind. Love does not see uh, just the weaknesses of the person, but love sees the strength. You see, the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he what? He gave his only begotten son. You see, God looked at us. He, he looked at us as that person that was beat up. I don't know about you, but I've been beat up. Some of you may have come from broken homes, uh, broken families, broken relationships, and what have you. And you've been beat up by Satan day in, month in, year in, and year out. You're estranged with others, and you're beat up psychologically, even spiritually. But God said, I sent my son, I sent my good Samaritan to come and wound up your broken heart. 
and give peace to your troubled mind. That's the kind of God we serve where he loves us so much that he said, I'm not going to leave you nor will I forsake you, but I'll be with you even until the end of the world. You see, God wants us all to be a good neighbor, and he sent his son to be that example of what a good neighbor is. To sacrificially give of yourself. It's easy to give out of abundance. Hmm? It's easy to give when you have a whole lot of time, but then there are times where you're like, I don't have any time to to help that person. I don't have any time to say a kind word to that person. I don't have any time to encourage that person or persons. Are you being a good neighbor? God provides us with many opportunities for us to reflect his love. We are to be the shining light in this very dark world. Huh? If the world is going to know Jesus, it's not going to be by just the words that you say, but it's going to be about the actions that you give. Are you a good neighbor? This is not a guilt trip message. It's a message to just pull back the curtains for you to examine you. Not your neighbor, but to examine you. I have to examine myself. Am I being a good neighbor to any and everyone I come in contact with? There's an old saying that preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. Hmm? Hello? So you're preaching it with the life that you live and the love that you give. Amen? Let us pray. Father, we are grateful and we are blessed today for this is a day that you have made that we have been glad and we shall be glad in it. We have rejoiced and we shall continue to rejoice because you are a sovereign God. You are a mighty God. You are a God of love and you are a God of peace. Lord, we just pray over these students as they have their school break that you will cover them, cover their hearts, cover their minds as they are traveling to and fro. Give them traveling mercy. Let your grace so everly abound in and all around them. Some may be going into hostile environments, but God, you're able to keep them. You're able to stabilize them. By the power of your Holy Spirit, lead them and guide them into all truth. Lord, now seal this word into the hearts and minds of your people. Let it be reflective in the light that they live in this very dark world. Let them know that they are beautifully and wonderfully made. In the matchless name of your Son and our Savior Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.